Mr. Harrison stood at the top of the veranda steps. The house was in darkness, but his cigarette glowed more brightly for it. A road lamp trapped the returning boy as he opened the gate, and Rusty knew he had been seen, but he didn't care much. If he had known that Mr. Harrison had not recognized him, he would have turned back instead of walking resignedly up the garden path. Mr. Harrison did not move, nor did he appear to notice the boy's approach. It was only when Rusty climbed the veranda steps that his guardian moved and said, Who's that? Still he had not recognized the boy, and in that instant Rusty became aware of his own condition, for his body was a patchwork of paint. Wearing only torn pajamas, he could, in the half-light, have been easily mistaken for the sweeper boy or someone else's servant. It must have been a newly acquired bizarre instinct that made the boy think of escape. He turned about, but Mr. Harrison shouted, Come here, you! And the tone of his voice, the tone reserved for the sweeper boy, made Rusty stop. Come up here, repeated Mr. Harrison. Rusty returned to the veranda, and his guardian switched on a light, but even now there was no recognition. Good evening, sir, said Rusty. Mr. Harrison received a shock. He felt a wave of anger, and then a wave of pain. Was this the boy he had trained and educated? This wild, ragged, ungrateful wretch who did not know the difference between what was proper and what was improper, what was civilized and what was barbaric, what was decent and what was shameful. And had the years of training come to nothing? Mr. Harrison came out of the windows and cursed. He brought his hand down on the back of Rusty's neck, propelled him into the drawing room and pushed him across the room so violently that the boy lost his balance, collided with the table and rolled over onto the ground. Rusty looked up from the floor to find his guardian standing over him, and in the man's right hand was the supple malacca cane, and the cane was twitching. Mr. Harrison's face was twitching too. It was full of fire. His lips were stitched together, sealed up with the ginger moustache, and he looked at the boy with narrowed, unblinking eyes. Filth, he said, almost spitting the words in the boy's face. My God, what filth! Rusty stared fascinated at the deep yellow nicotine stains on the fingers of his guardian's raised hand. Then the wrist moved suddenly and the cane cut across the boy's face like a knife, stabbing and burning into his cheek. Rusty cried out and cowered back against the wall. He could feel the blood trickling across his mouth. He looked around desperately for a means of escape. But the man was in front of him, over him, and the wall was behind. Mr. Harrison broke into a torrent of words. How can you call yourself an Englishman? How can you come back to this house in such a condition? In what gutter? In what brothel have you been? Have you seen yourself? Do you know what you look like? No said Rusty, and for the first time he did not address his guardian as sir. I don't care what I look like. You don't? Well, I'll tell you what you look like. You look like the mongrel that you are. That's a lie, exclaimed Rusty. It's the truth. I've tried to bring you up as an Englishman, as your father would have wished, but as you won't have it our way, I'm telling you that he was about the only thing English about you. You're no better than the sweeper boy. Rusty flared into a temper, showing some spirit for the first time in his life. I'm no better than the sweeper boy, but I'm as good as him. I'm as good as you. I'm as good as anyone. And instead of cringing to take the cut from the cane, he flung himself at his guardian's legs. The cane swished through the air, grazing the boy's back. 
Rusty wrapped his arms round his guardian's legs and pulled on them with all his strength. Mr. Harrison went over, falling flat on his back. The suddenness of the fall must have knocked the breath from his body, because for a moment he did not move. Rusty sprang to his feet. The cut across his face had stung him to madness, to an unreasoning hate, and he did what previously he would only have dreamt of doing, lifting a vase of the missionary's wife's best sweet piece of the glass cupboard. He flung it at his guardian's face. It hit him on his chest, but the water and flowers flopped out over his face. He tried to get up, but he was speechless. The look of alarm on Mr. Harrison's face gave Rusty greater courage. Before the man could recover his feet and his balance, Rusty gripped him by the collar and pushed him backwards until they both fell over onto the floor. With one hand still twisting the collar, the boy slapped his guardian's face. Mad with the pain in his own face, Rusty hit the man again and again, wildly and awkwardly, but with the giddy thrill of knowing he could do it. He was a child no longer. He was nearly 17. He was a man. He could inflict pain. That was a wonderful discovery. There was a power in his body, a devil or a god, and he gained confidence in his power, and he was a man. Stop that, stop it. The shout of a hysterical woman brought Rusty to his senses. He still held his guardian by the throat, but he stopped hitting him. Mr. Harrison's face was very red. The missionary's wife stood in the doorway, her face white with fear. She was under the impression that Mr. Harrison was being attacked by a servant or some bizarre hooligan. Rusty did not wait until she found her tongue, but, with a newfound speed and agility, darted out of the drawing room. He made his escape from the bedroom window. From the gate, he could see the missionary's wife silhouetted against the drawing room light. He laughed out loud. The woman swiveled round and came forward a few steps, and Rusty laughed again and began running down the road to the bazaar. It was late. The smart shops and restaurants were closed. In the bazaar, Oil lamps hung outside each doorway. People were asleep on the steps and platforms of shop fronts. Some huddled in blankets, others rolled tight into themselves. The road, which during the day was a busy, noisy crush of people and animals, was quiet and deserted. Only a lean dog still sniffed in the gutter. A woman sang in a room high above the street, a plaintive, tremulous song, and in the far distance, a jackal cried to the moon. But the empty, lifeless street was very deceptive. If the roofs could have been removed from but a handful of buildings, it would be seen that life had not really stopped, but beautiful and ugly persisted through the night. It was past midnight, though the clock tower had no way of saying it. Rusty was in the empty street, and the chart shop was closed. A sheet of tarpaulin draped across the front. He looked up and down the road, hoping to meet someone he knew, the chartwala. He felt sure he would give him a blanket for the night and a place to sleep. And the next day, when Somi came to meet him, he would tell his friend of his predicament, that he had run away from his guardian's house and did not intend returning. But he would have to wait till morning. The chat shop was shuttered, barred, and bolted. He sat down on the steps, but the stone was cold and his thin cotton pajamas offered no protection. He folded his arms and huddled up in a corner, but still he shivered. His feet were becoming numb, lifeless. Rusty had not fully realized the hazards of the situation. 
He was still mad with anger and rebellion and, though the blood on his cheek had dried, his face was still smarting. He could not think clearly. The present was confusing and unreal and he could not see beyond it. What worried him was the cold and the discomfort and the pain. The singing stopped in the high window. Rusty looked up and saw a beckoning hand. As no one else in the street showed any signs of life, Rusty got up and walked across the road until he was under the window. The woman pointed to a stairway and he mounted it, glad of the hospitality he was being offered. The stairway seemed to go to the stars, but it turned suddenly to lead into the woman's room. The door was slightly ajar and he knocked and a voice said, Come. The room was filled with perfume and burning incense. A musical instrument lay in one corner. The woman reclined on a bed, her hair scattered about the pillow. She had a round, pretty face, but she was losing her youth, and the fat showed in rolls at her exposed waist. She smiled at the boy and beckoned again. Thank you, said Rusty, closing the door. Can I sleep here? Where else? said the woman. Just for tonight. She smiled and waited. Rusty stood in front of her, his hands behind his back. Sit down, she said, and patted the bedclothes beside her. Reverently and as respectfully as he could, Rusty sat down. The woman ran little fair fingers over his body and drew his head to hers. Their lips were very close, almost touching, and their breathing sounded terribly loud to Rusty. But he only said, I am hungry. A poet, thought the woman, and kissed him full on the lips. But the boy drew away in embarrassment, unsure of himself, liking the woman on the bed and yet afraid of her. What's wrong? she asked. I'm tired, he said. The woman's friendly smile turned to a look of scorn, but she saw that he was only a boy whose eyes were full of unhappiness and she could not help pitying him. You can sleep here, she said until you have lost your tiredness. But he shook his head. I will come some other time, he said, not wishing to hurt the woman's feelings. They were both pitying each other, liking each other, but not enough to make them understand each other. Rusty left the room mechanically. He descended the staircase and walked up the bazaar road, past the silent sleeping forms, until he reached the clock tower. To the right of the clock tower was a broad stretch of grassland, where, during the day, cattle grazed and children played and young men like Ranbir wrestled and kicked footballs. But now, at night, it was a vast, empty space. But the grass was soft, like the grass in the forest, and Rusty walked the length of the medan. He found a bench and sat down, warmer for the walk. A light breeze was blowing across the medan, pleasant and refreshing, playing with his hair. Around him, everything was dark and silent and lonely. He had got away from the bazaar which held the misery of beggars and homeless children and starving dogs, and could now concentrate on his own misery, for there was nothing like loneliness for making Rusty conscious of his unhappy state. Madness and freedom and violence were new to him. Loneliness was familiar, something he understood. Rusty was alone. Until tomorrow, he was alone for the rest of his life. If tomorrow there was no Somi at the chat shop, no Ranbir, then what would he do? This question badgered him persistently, making him an unwilling slave to reality. He did not know where his friends lived, 
He had no money. He could not ask the chatwala for credit on the strength of two visits. Perhaps he should return to the amorous lady in the bazaar. Perhaps. But no, one thing was certain. He would never return to his guardian. The moon had been hidden by clouds and presently there was a drizzle. Rusty did not mind the rain. It refreshed him and made the color run from his body. But when it began to fall harder, he started shivering again. He felt sick. He got up, rolled his ragged pajamas up to the thighs and crawled under the bench. There was a hollow under the bench and at first Rusty found it quite comfortable. But there was no grass and gradually the earth began to soften. Soon he was on his hands and knees in a pool of muddy water with the slush oozing up through his fingers and toes. Crouching there, wet and cold and muddy, he was overcome by a feeling of helplessness and self-pity. Everyone and everything seemed to have turned against him. Not only his people, but also the bazaar and the chart shop and even the elements. He admitted to himself that he had been too impulsive in rebelling and running away from home. Perhaps there was still time to return and beg Mr. Harrison's forgiveness. But could his behavior be forgiven? Might he not be clapped into irons for attempted murder? Most certainly he would be given another beating, not six strokes this time, but nine. His only hope was Somi, if not Somi, then Ranbir, if not Ranbir, well, it was no use thinking further, there was no one else to think of. The rain had ceased, Rusty crawled out from under the bench and stretched his cramped limbs. The moon came out from a cloud and played with his wet, glistening body and showed him the vast, naked loneliness of the Medan and his own insignificance. He longed now for the presence of people, be they beggars or women, and he broke into a trot, and the trot became a run, a frightened run, and he did not stop until he reached the clock tower.